define what I meant by that. First of all, we spent a good two or three months before Occupy Wall Street creating this thing called the New York City General Assembly. And I absolutely recommend that anybody who's interested in organizing in a really democratic way on campus or anywhere, that you start by creating an assembly. Uh, you can call it a public assembly, a general assembly, whatever you want. But the idea of having an inclusive space where everybody is invited to just air their grievances and issues, and from there you can create more sort of uh, uh, sophisticated structures that might not be inclusive of everybody but are specific to interests or whatever. But the General Assembly was, the whole idea was that we can have this space where people can be safe to dissent. I talk a lot about dissent because there's a lot of people that aren't happy with the way things are and they don't feel that they have a safe space where, where they can talk about that without retribution. Like, for example, if you speak out as a, as a faculty on a university, you could lose your job. If you speak out as a student, you could lose your tuition or your, uh, your scholarship, right? So creating safe spaces where people can talk about issues that they face is so important. And when we created this space called the New York City General Assembly, we found that people came out in a big way and they wanted to get involved. And so we put them to the task of, of planning the actual occupation and also starting to talk about the purpose and why we're here and sort of what you know our mission is. And we came up with a statement which we called the Declaration of the Occupation of New York and maybe some of you have seen it. And it just laid out why we were doing this. It didn't lay out the solution right? because we were just getting started and we didn't have all the answers. But it laid out the why we're here. right? And the Declaration of the Occupation, first of all it says who we are. We are individuals. We are citizens. We are people of the 99%. And we're here because the system isn't working for us. And we talk about a whole range of issues. And we also say that we're not affiliated with any particular party, right, political party. We're not affiliated with any particular candidate. And that's so important for us. All along the way, people have said, are you going to endorse Barack Obama? Or are you going to you know, endorse Mitt Romney? Or are you going to endorse this local elected official or whatever. And we've always resisted that because it's not about, we don't think the solution is to put this person in rather than this person. It's like, that's just like shifting the chairs on the Titanic. It doesn't fix the problem. That if tomorrow Mitt Romney wins or Barack Obama wins, it's not gonna fix the situation either way. Now, I personally have my own opinions about which I think is a better candidate and everybody does. And that's okay because in this safe space, you can have your own political opinions and your views. But the fact is that, as a, that we don't speak for anybody else. I'm not going to speak for you and say, this, everybody here endorses Barack Obama. That's not cool, right? I have a problem with that. And I'm sure other people here have a problem with that. So it was very important, and it still is, for us to understand that we don't speak for anybody. We speak with you. And that notion of, of unity, but also dissent. That we can agree on certain things and still disagree on other things. And in this space, you're safe to do that. That you can talk about anything in this space and you won't be reprimanded for it. You, as long as you're respectful to the people here and you obey the community guidelines that we've come up with and, and you don't hurt people, right? And you don't try to speak for other people, you only speak for yourself then it's a safe space. And so the game plan was the occupation. And then after that, the discussion is, well, what do you do next? And to grow a movement, to turn a moment into a movement, you have to reach out. And you have to understand, what are the struggles of the 99%? Up to this point, I don't see any of the politicians in Washington really addressing the issues that face poor people, working people, right? And so for us, it really became about how do we become advocates for working people, for poor, low income, lower class, lower middle class, middle class people who are struggling right now. Because there's plenty of advocates for upper middle class and, and, and upper class and rich people. They have, they, they have their advocates, right? And also, at a certain point, if you have a certain amount of money and wealth, you really don't need government. I believe. At that point, I think you're good, right? Like, if you have money to take care of yourself and your family, you really, like, don't need the government. 
in a sense. So it's not really relevant. I mean, you try to, a lot of people with, in, with money and influence try to influence the government because they think it should be run a certain way. And everybody's within their rights to vote and to elect representatives, right? But I don't think that because you have a, a million dollars that your vote means more than mine. And I don't think because you have a million dollars that you should be able to give a, a half a million dollars to this candidate so that he can Im implement your policies because I don't have half a million dollars to give, right? So it comes to this point of saying, well, we don't have the resources to be able to buy lobbyists, to be able to do politics as usual in Washington. So we have to band together. And that was the notion. And, and everything that we've done since then has been about how do you grow this energy and, and help activate people so that they can make change in their community. Without trying to control the messaging or control anybody, if you, you know, who you vote for is your decision. What policies you support is your decision. But as long as you're doing something to make a change, and as long as you recognize that when you advocate, if it doesn't, if it doesn't help all people, then it's not in the spirit of Occupy. If it doesn't, if at the, at the end of the day, it's not about bringing opportunity to people, especially people with the least amount of resources, then you can call it Occupy, but I don't, I don't believe that it is, you know? That's what it's about. It's open. Yeah. What else? Oh. Yeah. I noticed you had a strike debt patch, and I was hoping to bring that up. Of course, and I didn't think that I was. Can you talk about that? So. Yeah, so if you guys saw on my jacket, I had this red felt square. I've got a couple of them if you want one. What that represents to me and to many people is this global student movement, student solidarity or student um, empowerment. And it really began in Montreal with the student strikes uh, this past year. And when students were striking uh, in their universities against the tuition hikes, they asked people to wear red felt squares in support of them to show that they supported them. And it quickly became a, a, a huge fad, really. I mean, not just a fad, but it became a huge show of support for them. And it traveled across the country and across the world. And when it got to New York City, students in New York City realized we're facing a lot of the same issues of rising costs of education, of more and more student debt that we, we can't pay off, right? The largest percentage of defaulters on student loan debt are aged 50 to 60. I mean, that's incredible, right? People that are in their 50s are defaulting on student loan debt. They can't pay their student loan debt. Right? So if you've gone, if you've been out of college for 20 or 30 years and you can't pay off your student loans, like how are you going to live your life? Right? Like how can people reach their potential if they're stuck, saddled with thousands and thousands of dollars in debt that they don't have jobs that can pay off? So it's like at some point it has to be addressed, and it goes back to organizing, right? Because there are debtors and there are creditors. If you know anything about debt, it basically works like this. There are people that have debt and there are people that sell debt, right? That 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 get you in debt. <laughs> right? And they give you they loan you money, right? And they expect you to pay it back with interest. Right? And the only people that get zero interest or low interest are like banks, because that's how the government works. So everybody else is saddled with a lot of debt. And creditors are very well organized. Creditors like banks and uh, Sally May and Sally Freddie Mac and all you know everybody Fannie Mae, Sally. yeah Fannie Mae Freddie, Freddie Mac Sally whatever there's like too many of them they're very well organized and they have their lobbyists and they advocate for laws that help them to give more credit and collect higher interest rates that's their interest there's also debtors they're not organized there's nobody in Washington that represents debtors that says you know what maybe these interest rates are too high we should lower them or you know what maybe People should be able to get out of student loan debt if they go bankrupt. Because if you go bankrupt, it's like a new start. You should have a chance to start again, right? So student loan debt's the only type of debt that you can't shake off if you go into bankruptcy. And now I'm hearing about people, you know, students that pass away and the debt gets transferred to their family. Or, you know, I mean, just insane things, right? And there's nobody out there that's advocating for debtors. So we started this thing called Strike Debt which is all about organizing debtors, people who are in debt, 
to to fight back against these these predatory policies, right? And we wear that red symbol to reflect that and to say we want. Well, first, first thing we say is we're organizing <laughs> that we're going to do something, but also we say we want fair debt policies so that that don't straddle people with millions of dollars of debt that they can never get out of. And it's not just student loan debt, it's medical debt, it's credit card debt, it's mortgage debt, it's everything. So that's what that's about. All right, so what would you say to those people? Because I've, ha I've heard lots of teachers even say, yeah. you know, what would you say to the person who's just like, and forgive me because I showed up late, doctor, okay. yada, yada. So forgive me if you have already explained this, but um, what would you say to the people who are like, you know, what would you say to those people who are saying, you know, what are these people doing? What, what are these people doing? What are they out there for? Or when you finally get to negotiate with the people that have power, yeah. what exactly do you want to negotiate? You know, yeah. um, that type of thing. Well, you missed the first part where I dispelled yeah. the myths. And that was for the myths about what we are. So, ask somebody about that later. Yeah. But the, the, yeah. The, the question is, basically at the end of the day, like, what's the purpose? What do you want, right? Yeah. And the answer is, Somebody said to me, why don't you go sit down with the bankers and negotiate? And I said, that's not a bad idea, but here's Wall Street, and here's Occupy Wall Street, right? So there's, there is some in between, right? But we are asking for this, and they want to give this, you know? So, but that's how negotiation works, right? You ask for more than you're going to get, yeah. because you're not going to get it, right? So, the, so for me, Occupy Wall Street in respect to Wall Street is about why is there no rule of law on Wall Street? How come they can get away with the things that they get away with, right? How come they're able to totally destroy our economy and then nobody's held accountable for it? Because I don't believe that idea that it was just a whole bunch of bad fortune and some risks that people took. I believe it was fraud. Mm -hmm. I, I truly believe that people were fraudulent. And some people have gone to jail but they've gone to jail because they ripped off investors. But the thing is, investors are the one percent for the most part. Like investors the are already they rich. ripped off people. Who yeah, but when you rip them. off me and you rip off people by foreclosing on their homes and you rip off people by by giving them fraud fraudulent mortgages, why don't you go to jail for that? You know, so it's like for me the biggest, the most important thing to understand about the Wall Street versus Occupy Wall Street battle is that Occupy Wall Street, 9,000 arrested, Wall Street, zero arrested. Something's wrong. Something's wrong there, right? Because the people that are hurting Americans, the people that are really anti-American, they're in their offices in Manhattan and all over the country, and they're hurting people, and they're not being held accountable. So I want fair accountability and, and, and regulation of Wall Street so that people, yes, can have a chance to be successful, right? Be entrepreneurial. Businesses can get loans to start their businesses. That's important, right? But it's got to be fair. It can't be at the expense of working people. It can't, we can't have another crisis like this. The banks are bigger than they were when they were too big to fail. You know, so they're too bigger to fail now. And that's, to me, that's what that's about. So fair accountability and, and regulation on Wall Street and there, I can go into more specifics of that, like I can talk about specific policies with you, but I think that it, it's important to understand that it's bigger than that, because Wall Street is sort of like where all roads lead. Whether you're talking about environmental destruction, you're talking about financial destruction, whether you're talking about systemic racism and oppression and that kind of destruction, it's all, it all leads back to Wall Street. And, it, and it, what it really, at the end of the day, leads back to is the fact that the economic system that we have, that some call capitalism, is not working right now. Capitalism as it exists isn't working. And there are people who say fix capitalism, and there are people who say that eliminate capitalism. But in either case, neither of those things is happening right now. Right? It's not happening because there's no rule of law for people on Wall Street. There's no accountability for people on Wall Street. What can you what can you speak to or how can you direct us towards more information on what I feel is a very big 
part of this, which would be serious campaign reform. Yeah. Serious campaign reform as it, as it, as it um, completely plays into the concept of corporations are running our country. Politicians yeah. are not. Yeah. So there's a, a, a part of our movement called Move to Amend, which is a group that is working to amend the Constitution to end uh, corporate personhood. This idea that corporations are people, money is free speech, that therefore you can give unlimited money to candidates and you don't have to tell anybody about it and whatever. That whole mess of the corruption in our government, th this group moved to amend is, is proposing a constitutional amendment for that. But I would also say that it's not just about ending corporate personhood because before Citizens United there was corruption, <coughs> right? The fact of the matter is the only way to end corruption is if people get up, and again, apathy is the enemy, right? People get up and get involved and demand that their leaders represent them. Right. And if they don't represent them, then they kick them out. Because the only safeguard against corruption is when people actually hold their leaders accountable. And, it, and part of the reason why that isn't happening is because every four years, 50% of people don't vote, right? And I'm not blaming people who don't vote. This is not what I'm saying, right? What I'm saying is that 50% of people don't vote and a good percentage of those people aren't registered to vote, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're making it harder to register to vote, mm -hmm. that's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's a real problem. I don't understand why you can't vote with your birth certificate in this country. I don't understand why you can't get a voter registration card when you're born in this country. And then when you turn whatever age, 18 or whatever we decide, then you can vote, right? I also don't understand why 16-year-olds can't vote. I think the 16-year-olds should be able to vote. But the fact of the matter is that we shouldn't be making it harder for people to vote. That's crazy. Okay. That's insane. What else? How do you make sure it doesn't go too far? Because that's what you were saying to, yeah. to the Avery, yeah, <laughs> the ENR guests doing things. So if you have people like that in the movement, how do you make sure it doesn't get out? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that it, it all comes... Question. Yeah, the, the question she asked was, how do you make sure that it doesn't get out of hand in protest, that people don't get violent, for example? And I think that it's important to understand, um, first of all, for, if we're to be clear amongst people, what is violence, right? Like, there are people that believe that property damage isn't violence, right? And I think that in certain cases, a kind of targeted property damage that doesn't hurt people, but is targeted at at, at, at wrongdoing, is actually uh, appropriate. For example, this this country essentially began on an act of property damage, the Boston Tea Party, right? So, and and the folks that did the Boston Tea Party were dressed up as as indigenous, as Native Americans, right, to protect themselves. So, in a similar way to people dressing all black and wear and black block, it's called, right, that tactic. So I think it's important to understand that whenever you do protest, people should be able to see your protest and understand what you're doing. You don't, if, if at some point it becomes, if it's not done in a really smart way, it kind of, it comes off as crime, right? And, and the government and others are always trying to criminalize protest to make it look like what you're doing is criminal and not political. Right? And we know that it's political, so we need to make sure that people understand that this is political. This is about change. It's not about hurting people physically. It's about dramatizing and, and, and highlighting the injustice that exists. And so training people in nonviolent direct action is what, something we do tremendously. Everybody who's coming into our protest, for the most part, is coming through training that we hold that teach people how to be disobedient in a civil way, that teach people how to be arrested, right? That help people make decisions about what kind of involvement they want to have so that people don't get arrested without wanting to be arrested, right? Because that can be a very traumatic experience. I know because I've been there. And that, you know, it's, it's very important that people feel safe when they're involved, right? So you as an organizer, as somebody who's making this stuff happen, it's your responsibility to train people to create community so that people feel safe when they're taking action together. And when you do that, you also find that people will respect the consensus of the group. They'll respect the fact that we are making this a nonviolent protest. 
that we are not going to um, we're not going to hit the police, for example, right? Because I can tell you that the when 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 young kids were being hosed <coughs> in Birmingham, Alabama, in sixty somebody help me, sixty five. Thank you. That um, it, it wasn't in the papers and on the news the next day because young kids were hitting police officers in Birmingham, Alabama. It was there because they were getting hosed and being sicked with dogs. And there were a couple kids that started throwing rocks at the police. And an organizer got on a, took a police megaphone and said, if you're going to be violent, go home. That's not what this is about. And I, so I'm, I'm firmly, uh, I firmly believe in nonviolent protests. I think that if, if, but I also respect diversity of tactics. And so what that means is that I respect your form of protest as long as you're not hurting people, right? As long as, and as long as you understand that we're in this struggle together, and so we have to work together and make sure that people understand why we're doing this, and that it doesn't devolve into violence. Because the vi violence is easy for the state and the government to handle. And whenever protest devolves into violence, they just send in the National Guard. And in some ways, a lot of people feel like that was one of the downfalls of the, the protest movements of the 60s, is that some of them became violent, and then it gave an excuse for the government to come in and just shut it down. And that's not what this is about. You know, I, yeah, that's not what this is about. Yeah. But it's hard. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I have to go yeah. take care of job business. You haven't met me yet. I'm Tara Mann in the yeah. Sociology CJ Department. Uh, I am your ride back to your hotel. Okay. Don't anybody make any jokes. There is no such thing as a faculty special. Um, can you find your way back to Fayers? I think yeah. so. Okay. And I've got to walk yeah. by there. Okay. Get to my truck. Okay, but that's where I'm headed. But okay. I just got to go now to be there at Beautiful. four. I wanted to be sure you weren't going to be a band on the wrong foot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good call. Thank you for the correction. Yep. <laughs> Clarified. Yes. You mentioned the American Revolution and the Civil Rights Movement, both of which led to results, but not without hitting violence first. It's you know, true. The Civil Rights, the American Revolution started off as a peaceful protest, you know, with politicians, and then led to the Tea Party, and then led to ultimately a war. And then the Civil Rights got somewhat results, but ultimately became effective after they were scared of Black Panther. You know, how can you expect to see? Because you said it yourself, nobody will willingly give up their power. No, nobody will volunteer to make less money. Yeah. So how can you convince these people nonviolently to do just that? You know, I think that, I mean, first of all, I, I think your point about piggybacking is, is true. I think it's one particular reason for the stagnation, and I think there's a whole lot of other ones. Right. And a lot of it has less to do with the sort of parliamentary procedure or the rules of the government, and more to do with the social situation that we find ourselves in as a country that's becoming more and more unequal. And at a certain point, this inequality makes it uh, nearly impossible to have a true democracy because how can the interests of such different groups be, be uh, uh, compromised or be sort of, you know, how can, how can a country that's become so unequal sustain itself when, when there are so many people in need and there's, there's also people that are just so well off. Yeah. And it's not that I'm calling for redistribution of wealth in the sense that some people might say, like socialism. There's already redistribution of wealth happening. It's from working people to the 1%. If you don't believe me, ask yourself why General Electric got $3.2 billion in tax credits. In other words, they got a check from the government rather than paying the government in tax. That would be the same. You ask why BP is about to get essentially a bailout, but a tax credit on the billions of dollars they lost for dumping oil into the into the sea. I mean, it's insane, right? Like socialism for corporations is what we've got, and that's that's a problem. And everybody's got their little loophole, and it's not helping us. It's helping people who don't need help. It's helping people who've already got the resources. I've been saying that about the oil industry for yeah. years, and everybody looks at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> that. When, when these politicians get to Washington, yeah. <laughs> what's the first thing they do when they get money? They're going to invest in the one thing on Wall Street that never goes down. Right. Oil. 
So when they vote, they're voting for oil. So they're never, we're never going to get break our dependency if we don't get some kind of rule that a, a congressman or a senate can't have oil stock <coughs> of some kind. Organize, man. Organize, because the oil companies are very organized. Yeah. Do you think that um, the free market could be a solution, like actually having the free market be free rather than controlled through the government? Or do you think that that's actually the problem? I just don't know what a free market system looks like because I'm, I haven't seen it in practice. It's not here. Mm -hmm. It's not free market, you know, when when uh, when companies get bailed out so they don't go underwater. Real capitalists don't get bailouts, you know. It's not a free market when you and I have to pay for the risks that they take. I understand that, and that's so why I'm I, asking hypothetical. Hypoth I can't talk hypothetically. I think that if you look at a country like Chile, right, which had supposedly had a free market economy but it was under a dictatorship if that's the only way that you can have free market capitalism I, I don't want a dictatorship I want a democracy mm -hmm. so I'm not sure I don't have the answer to that but my my suspicion is that free market is an illusion I think that there's always going to have to be regulation I just think that it should be regulation that protects poor people and not protects rich mm -hmm. people um. Something that I'm glad you address is the myths, because when talking to people about Occupy, I feel like a lot of people, um, a lot of people keep saying that they don't know what Occupy stands for or that they don't get it. And I feel like a lot of it's the people that just disagree with Occupy, but I also feel like it's a lot of people who actually may agree but may be too afraid to take action, mm -hmm. so they try to maybe like pretend they don't know what's going what's going on with Occupy, or maybe they really don't. Um, so, like, what's like one way to sum up what Occupy is about, like, like really simply in a few sentences that you often tell people if they just like don't get it or don't want to get it? Yeah. Um, one, I mean, the tagline that you know we use sometimes is Occupy Wall Street is a leaderless resistance movement for economic justice, economic and social and political justice. Uh, it is global movement and it is about people rising up in their local communities I should speak up I guess it's about people rising up in their local communities to find solutions to the problems of our current economic and political system and I think that's a pretty a pretty good summary and it looks different in different places but I think that's Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to get things accomplished too, and I'm getting resistance from a lot of people. I understand. Yeah, that's that's the stagnation, you know. What are we gonna do about it? Is the answer is the question, right? Yeah. No, I I, I understand. I voted for Obama four years ago. And I was expecting hope and change, and I didn't get it. And I think a lot of young people feel that way now. And um, but what I understood last year was that if I want change, I've got to take to the streets, and I've got to fight for it, and I've got to be smart, and I've got to organize, and I've got to, I've got to take it on myself to make that change because he's not going to do it for me. Yeah. Also. Yeah. I guess we'll just see, man. I have no comment, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm always hopeful, but I'm also skeptical of anybody who thinks they can solve everything. And it's not about the matter of time, it's about the consent of the governed. And people have lost faith in, in a big way in their government, at least I feel that way. And, uh, and the only way to get it back is, well, one way is for uh, people to organize 
and actually show and get some wins and show that because we got some wins in New York, like you know some serious wins. I can go into details with anybody who wants to talk about it. But also, our leaders have to show that they're responsive to us. And if they're not talking about the issues that we're talking about, that doesn't show me that that you're responsive to me. So it feels like, you know, you're not you're not hearing me. Or if you are hearing me, you're ignoring me because your campaign donors have more influence over you than I do. And that's a problem. So, and it's a problem with Obama, it's a problem with Romney, I think it's a problem with the whole damn system. Justin, I don't know how old you are, but I represent a totally different faction, um, which is getting to be a, lar a much larger group on yeah. campuses across America. And there are people who are going, I'm 45. Yeah. I'm a mother of four. I've got one who's already graduated from college, one who's in it, one who's 11, and one who's four. Yeah. Cal is also a non-traditional student. He's put his 20 plus years into the service before coming back to school. Um, we're here for different reasons, but predominantly they're because the, this economy, the economy has tanked so much yep. that we can't go out and get jobs. I could get 10 years ago, eight years ago, right. um, helping to support my family. Right. Um, and and you know, I voted for Clinton. I mean, I, I mean, I've been, I'm so old that I feel like I've seen so many things go right. on that um, that you guys are. It's you know, I, it's sad. It's so sad to me to show up at a, a thing like this and have only this many out of what 15,000 commuter students at the school give a shit about making a difference. I think I mean, people care. I just I, I think people don't have time. Well, it's here's thing. the thing. That's not an excuse, but I think people here's the thing. are too busy in their life. If they don't start figuring out at this age yeah. that what you just said, that you cannot depend on your politicians to make the change for you, you have to be the change every day, then it's not going to change. Right. It's not going to change. And I mean, that's everything from, and, and I say this as a person who is makes it makes an effort to be an activist on a daily basis, and it and it may not be on a large scale, sometimes it try, I try to be, but it's, it's showing up and running the PTA at my kid's school, which is a 94% poverty school. It's going to Goodwill and yeah. buying belts for the boys who can't afford it to give them a sense of dignity. You know, it, yeah. whatever those little tiny things are right. that, you know, we need to be reminding each other that make a huge difference. But it's collectively um, that will make an enormous difference. Yeah. And I, I want to agree with you. I, I do believe that, you know, I'm, I'm really, it's hard to be... And I'm a libertarian, but it's hard to be anything but a Republican in the South. It's really hard. I voted for Obama four years ago too, and I haven't given up on him. Um, I haven't given up. I think he's he's got a lot that he's going to that he's trying to turn around. And and to me, the Bush years were total devastation. And, and I'm speaking as a, a woman and a, and a mother of three girls and one boy, and I have a lot at stake in this next election. I think every woman has a lot at stake in this next election in ways that none that some of you men do not. But, um, you know, if, if, if we can't, I mean, if I just want to challenge everyone to take it on themselves to make sure tomorrow they ask at least 10 people, did you vote today? Have you gone to vote? I mean, I've, I've been doing this for the last three months. Have you registered to vote? Everyone I come in contact with, have you remembered to register? Are you registered? Yeah. Um, because it's the way I talk to my older children. And, I mean, it, it, takes, it, it takes a lot of energy. But you're right. I mean, we've got to really get grassroots about it every day to try and make a difference on the on the big scale. Yeah. I mean, my 11-year-old asked me the other day, and, and then I'll leave it at that. She said, you know, we're talking about, you know, her opinion is that, you know, what is wrong with us what, as humans, and she's 11, you know, we were given this huge gift of evolution, and look at what we've done with it. You know, we really need to return to fish for a little while <laughs> so that the planet can repair itself. And, and you know, and her, her, her verbatim was like, you know, what happens when we break the ozone layer, Mom? Really, what's going to happen? <laughs> and I'm like, baby, we just have to try every day to do things differently. Wow. And her question to me was, well, you know, I really want to be a marine biologist, but really, Mom, can the president really change anything? And she's thinking in her little head, um, which is pretty big for an 11 year old. Maybe I ought to be president. Maybe that's what I ought to do, you know? And I'm thinking, you know, honestly, Bella, no, the president really, you've got more power doing and thinking the way you think right now than being the president. So, you know, I mean, and that's what we need to engender in each other that we have, the, you know, it's us. This is our country. It's true. And that's yeah. something yeah. that's not a, a partisan thing to say. I think that I, had, I was in a debate 
last week. I'll be brief because I see other questions. I was in a debate with uh, some Tea Party activists, and uh, you know, we, it, went, it went really well actually. <laughs> a lot of differences, but there's some common ground. And, and one of them was that a lot of folks in the Tea Party, especially libertarians, which were the initial Tea Party activists, the Liberty it's, Movement, it's Ron swerved. Paul, libertarians, before Dick Army and before Charles and David Koch and before the Republicans. Dick you know, before all that, and, and I have respect even today for, for a lot of Tea Party activists, but it has shifted, I think. They want limited government because they want to empower people in their communities to take on these issues right. and not have somebody in Washington telling them how to live their lives. And I agree with that 100%. So there's a lot of common ground there, and it's all about community empowerment at the local level. Yeah, I had a, I had two questions. One for her. I'm curious, uh, what's the name of your genius little daughter? Her name is Isabella. Isabella. Isabella Hood. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Future president. I'm gonna quote Isabella. that on Facebook. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, and I had a question. When Occupy Wall Street started, and throughout the months and going on the year, how much support did you did you guys get from traditional roots of change, like unions or social activist groups that are Yeah. It's slow to start, like anything, you know, because a lot of the unions are, are very much establishment players and they are hesitant to kind of jump on board anything that looks too radical. I didn't think it was very radical, but I guess, you know, that's that's what they said. But <laughs> within a week or two, the, all the polls were like 80% of the country knows this, this is happening and 60% uh, agree with it, you know, and the unions were all on board and, and all the local groups were on board, the immigrants' rights groups, the LGBT groups, the, you name it, uh, they're all on board because they understood that this was a struggle of a, a lot of people, that this represented a real, um, a hope that we could actually wake people up out of their apathy and no matter what your political persuasion, that you would be excited and, and activated by this thing. In the same way I think that the Tea Party started out of that anger at the bailouts and the anger of the cronyism and the corruption, you know, and the and the government trying to, you know, tell people how to live their lives. I mean, that fiscal, it, it was really originally about the bailouts and fiscal responsibility, which actually I think are the same issues as Occupy Wall Street. If you understand fiscal responsibility to mean that our government shouldn't be buying wars on credit cards and, mm -hmm. and bailing out banks without with money that it doesn't have and all, and all these things, that's fiscal responsibility to mean, right? So it's, it, to me, the, the two are very similar expressions of anger that have evolved differently and are definitely different socially on a lot of issues, you know? But it's, it, at the end of the day, it's about people rising up and saying, enough is enough, we're not going to wait for other people to fix our problems, we're going to take this on ourselves. And that, and that is a, an exciting idea for people. It's a very exciting idea. But education is so key, right? And, mm -hmm. and anything that keeps people from getting an, an education, I think that's a crime. I think that, you know, when when I, you know, my one of my closest friends had to drop out of school because she couldn't afford the tuition anymore. I think that's a crime. You know, I blame the university, but I also blame a society that doesn't prioritize getting people a, a good education. You know, you need it. You need it today. So let's figure out how to do it. You know, this is a parish that um, has only recently, in the last like, in the last two weeks, been up 